I have just had the pleasure of spending the entire afternoon with a group of very, very smart individuals who work for a big pharmaceutical supply company. And the program is around maximizing presentation impact. And oh, so many questions were asked and answered, and we went through the basics. And what I wanted to share with all of you today is yes, the world has changed insofar as platforms of communication have changed. And we're now presenting both virtually in person in a hybrid scenario. People's stress levels is at an all time high. Yes, things have changed. The amount of information that we get on a daily basis is overwhelming. So a lot has changed, but what remains the same is people have a need to communicate. People have a need to feel valued. People have a need to be acknowledged. So let's start off with when we give presentations, what has stayed the same? What has stayed the same is we always need to say to ourselves, who is my audience? Now, it doesn't matter if the audience is virtual or hybrid or in-person or virtual only. We always have to say, who is this audience? Why do they need to hear my message? What's in it for them? That hasn't changed. I always suggest that people go, who is my audience? What do I want people to think, feel, do as a result of my communication? And then something else that hasn't changed is the what's in it for them? What's the benefit if they take my advice and guidance? And those things are foundational, whatever platform, whatever time of year, whatever is going on in the world has not changed. So that's my theme today is what has changed and what hasn't changed. The other thing that hasn't changed is that we have to create messages that allow the audience to go, I am going to solve a problem they're having or I'm going to inform them. And do we right at the top of a communication let people know that? Now, the technique might change. For example, right now I am communicating via my webcam and I am looking into the camera. Whereas if I was doing this in a hybrid situation, I might look at you, my virtual audience, then I might say to my virtual audience, I am also going to include my in-person audience. So technique may change and we have to be aware of that. But structure of communication and the need for clarity hasn't changed. One of my favorite, favorite all time sayings is in the absence of proper information, people come to their own conclusions. So what do we say in the absence of proper communication? people come to their own conclusions. And that's so important to remember. So even little things of if we stumble or fumble or there's a faux pas in our presentation, the ability to calmly say to the individual or individuals at the other end of the webcam or your audience, simply apologies. I've clean forgotten what I was about to say, let me just regroup for a moment. So just be transparent, be authentic, let people know, be relaxed. The other thing that hasn't changed is that people get nervous. People get nervous whether they're doing a virtual presentation or people get nervous when they are doing a in-person presentation. So I will quickly share my Combat Nerves with Nadia video with you. I do have a whole TEDx talk on this about owning your confidence. But for the wonderful group that I have just spoken to, I wanted to give you the short version of what we spoke about. So here it is, Combat Nerves with Nadia. And this is applicable whatever platform you are speaking on. Hello, I'm Nadia Bilchik, a professional speaker and broadcaster. And I speak around the world and I get asked lots of questions. I get asked, who's the best person you've ever interviewed? What was it like to meet Nelson Mandela? And is George Clooney really so sexy? But the question I get asked most, and this is from Dubai to Durban, is before you give a presentation or before you stand up in front of a group of people, do you get 
nervous. So I'm going to share a couple of tips, a couple of great antidotes to dealing with your nerves. The first and most powerful antidote to nervousness is mental. What is your mind focusing on when you feel nervous? And at this point, I ask you to start developing something called your positive emotional memory database. And what is that? That's a series of positive past experiences that validate you. So think for a moment of anything in the last couple of years, be it a job, promotion, or getting a job, or even watching your child being born. Something that when you recall, makes you smile, makes you feel successful, confident, and powerful. And as you get nervous, and as you face with an intimidating scenario, simply play that video in your mind, and it's amazing how your body will respond. The second thing that I always do is I go to the far end of wherever I'm speaking or to the back end of the CNA newsroom and I do something rather unusual. I take a deep breath in and I go one, two, three, huh. let me show you that again. One, two, three, huh. now that's one of those things that you really have to do backstage and not in front of your audience. One of the tendencies when people get nervous is that their voice system gets high-pitched and breathy. So, one of the most powerful things you can do so that you don't sound nervous is a series of voice exercises. Very simply, taking the vowel sounds A, E, I, O, and U, start with with the vowel sound U, I hope you notice the sound is now in front of my mouth and it's very resonant and round and it sounds deep and I sound relaxed. One of the best antidote to nerves is the three P's of practice, practice, practice. Know who you're speaking to, what you want them to think, feel and do as a result of this communication. And I like to ask a question when I start a presentation. That way, the focus goes from me and the attention goes from me to the audience. So practice asking a question. I've shared a couple of tips with you and very briefly, if you want more detail on any of these, please take a look at my book, Small Changes, Big Impact, which is maximizing your presence and leveraging the power of your personal brand. It is available on amazon.com. So the other thing that hasn't changed is the need to own your space. So whether you are presenting virtually or in person, do you really own your space? And what does it mean to own? So what does it mean to own your space? So own your space, which is my book, keynotes, workshops, is all around giving yourself permission to be the person presenting information. If you are giving a sales presentation or you are being interviewed for a new position, do you own your space? Do you look comfortable? Do you look confident? Do you come across both confidently and competently? And in owning your space, you need to understand the verbal and non-verbal elements of your physical space. In other words, what you say, but equally important is how you say it. And then we look at your virtual owning your space. Is your LinkedIn profile complete? Do you have a good picture of yourself? Think about owning your podium when you give a presentation. Do you look comfortable? Do you look commanding? So these are just some of the topics that I cover in Own Your Space. And I ask you to really think about, do you maximize the overall way you project yourself in every interaction? Because if you do, you are truly owning your space. And the 
purpose of my chatting to you today was to say, yes, a great deal has changed. The platforms we communicate on change, being able to do a presentation both virtually and in person. And if you're virtual, some of the people you talk to may be in person. If you're in person, some of the people you're speaking to may be virtual. And so it goes on. So yes, those things have changed. We speak about a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So much has changed. Technology keeps changing. I just bought a new camera because my last camera, which was an external camera, I got told wasn't quite sharp enough, so I had to upgrade. We're constantly upgrading technology and everything else. But what stays the same is people's need to feel that you are talking to them. What stays the same is your ability to look comfortable and competent. What stays the same is thinking about the person you are communicating to and not yourself. And it really struck me in my session this afternoon with this wonderful group of people. And if you're watching, thank you again for just being so participative and interactive. And I've been teaching and training for the last three decades. And there's certain foundational things. And knowing who your audience is, what you want them to think, feel, do remains the same. And yes, we've all had to adapt and learn and be agile and understand new platforms, but there's certain foundational things. Another foundational thing that hasn't changed is when you're presenting, be it in person or virtual, are you using vocal inflection? So I talk about vocal inflection as highlighting certain words with your voice. So in the same way that we would highlight with the highlight or underline, your voice can do that. So if I'm talking about increased profits of X thousand dollars, am I using my voice to emphasize that? And these are things that you can do to make your presentation or your presence more interesting and compelling. The other thing that you can do is always hook your audience. And I'm going to end today talking about a hook because a hook is one of those things that whatever platform you are delivering on is very helpful in really connecting with your audience. So love to know your thoughts on what has changed and what stays the same in an uncertain world. So what is a hook? A hook is the beginning of your presentation. It's that first couple of minutes. It's the prime real estate. It's in that first couple of minutes that all your audience decides, is this person worth paying attention to or should I mentally zone out? So whether you are giving a presentation in person or virtually, please remember that there's certain ways that you can immediately grab your audience's attention. You can ask them a question, a statement, a fact. You can tell a story that links into your subject matter, or you can go situation, complication, question, or message. So if we're talking to an audience about working from home and why working from home should be something that we continue to do, I might start off with a story of an employee who we wouldn't otherwise have attracted if they weren't allowed to work from home. Or I could tell you statistically or factually the amount of individuals who would prefer to work from home. Or I might break it into situation, complication, question, message, which is the situation we're in is that the world has changed and people have enjoyed working from home. The complication is we are now forcing people to go back into the workplace. The question is, what can we do to bridge that gap? Well, that's what I'm here to talk to you about. So please think about how you are going to start a presentation and do it in a way that poses a question and says that your presentation is going to answer that question. I'm Nadia Bilchik, and for more tips and techniques on virtual or in-person presentations, please go onto my website, 